this is a real treat for me because I think this, the last two talks really illustrates beautifully the importance of the cross-disciplinary approach to behaviour change. Um, and I'm going to try to synthesise them uh, it, and, uh, and draw some conclusions using my own area of smoking cessation as, a, as an example. Um, so when I saw Kate's slides just before um, uh, coming here, um, I was very struck by something, one of the diagrams in, in her slides, which was about what a model is. And uh, what we've got from Anthony is, is another sort of definition of a model. Um, what I want to try to do is to persuade you, uh, or you can persuade me, one way or the other, um, that um, the term model, like most of the terms we use, uh, is socially defined, and it's defined for a particular purpose. And so what we tend to do is, if we work in a particular area, um, we think of the constructs uh, in that area, and we apply them in that way. But then by engaging with people from other disciplines, we realize, realize that that's not the only way of doing it. Um, but let me start by the sort of my, what I think is perhaps a broader conceptualization, even though you may not agree with it, uh, of what I think when talking about a scientific model. Um, it is a rep and it's, and it's very similar to, to what Kate has uh, talked about, and actually very similar to what Anthony's talked about, but perhaps a bit broader. Um, so I think of a scientific model as a representation of a system um, which consists of constructs, what Kate would call elements, and relationships between these, what Kate would call both relationships and processes. And the reason, I think there are reasons for combining those, sometimes usefully, into one concept. And what um, Anthony might call um, transitions or functions. And the reason I think of it just in those two terms is, is, is because of the way our language is constructed and the way that we think about things, which is sort of subject predicate or subject predicate object. And effectively, what our models are, even if they're expressed in maths or they're expressed in pictures, are formulations of that idea. And what we use them to do, as, as Kate has uh, illustrated and, and so has Anthony, is uh, to describe relevant characteristics of a system. They're not going to describe the whole system, otherwise they would be that system. Um, we use them to make predictions, and we use them to develop interventions, to change the world in some way, and that's what we're interested in. And ultimately, that, that's, in my, in my view, what the taxpayer pays us to do. You know, if we, if we understand things perfectly, and we simulate things perfectly, that's absolutely fine, um, and we can get our papers published, but ultimately, if we don't do anything useful with it, then um, it's just an academic exercise. Um, but then when we talk about a theory, um, what we're doing is taking a model and we're saying that it purports to explain a set of phenomena. Um, so the model that we're constructing, uh, which we're going to call a theory, might include constructs and relationships which we can't observe, but we infer from the things that we can observe. So the thing about a theory is that it's used, first of all, to understand the phenomenon, to help us to get a, a, a picture of um, why things are happening. Um, but in our field, in all fields actually, theories are also used, very importantly, to guide observation. Because they tell us where to look for things that we haven't thought of looking, whether it's physics or um, uh, whether it's psychology. And of course, they're there to develop interventions. Now, if we're thinking about what a what's going to make a good theory, um, or a better theory. Um, there are a number of different criteria which are used, and in, in um, the ABC book, um, Susan and her team uh, developed nine criteria, which they got general agreement on, and I've sort of collapsed them into five so that they spell space, <laughs> which is, I think, the main purpose of the model. Um, just to get a good background. Anyway, um, scope, how far does the theory explain what it sets out to? For example, lots of theories in behaviour change um, say that they're theories of behaviour, but they're not theories of behaviour. They're theories of particular behaviour, particular context. Like the theory of planned behaviour, beloved of many health psychologists, it's not a theory of behaviour, it's a theory of planned behaviour. You know, the clue was in the title. And so, uh, when we go around saying, oh, this doesn't explain this, that and the other, uh, you know, um, Eisen would say, yes, well, it wasn't supposed to, but actually, um, often we're not specific about that. It should be parsimonious. I was taught of, of when I did physics at school, and I've remembered it ever since, and I've applied it. Occam's razor. Do not introduce parameters that you don't need to introduce. So does it have the minimum 
required number of elements. And those of us who do regression modeling are very familiar with the idea of not over-specifying a model. Very important. Um, and these things, are not, these things are not academic. For example, I'll just give you a very brief example. I've had a long discussion recently about e-cigarettes with a guy called Stan Glantz in California who thinks that they're evil and should be banned. And I point out to him that uh, in, in the rise in e-cigarette usage in the last uh, couple of years in the UK has coincided with an increase in the rate at which people are quitting smoking and an increase in the rate at which smoking prevalence has gone down. So I'm thinking, you know, you're going to have to come up with a pretty good explanation as to why that could occur if e-cigarettes are a bad thing. And he says, yes, but it would have been even faster and, the, and the, you, know, you can see the problem there. You know, that as soon as you start ad hoc to introduce parameters into something, you can explain absolutely anything and you're never going to get anywhere. Accuracy, the, the theory should fit the observable data. Uh, as Anthony has pointed out, if you've, got a, if you've got a model or a theory which just doesn't work, um, in terms of saying things that are patently not true, which a lot of psychological theories do, then it seems to me you ought to go back to the drawing board. Uh, and a classic example of that, with apologies for those of you who are, who are uh, supporters of it, is the trans theoretical model of behaviour change, which, which actually simply doesn't fit the data. Now, people who support it will say, OK, well, it may not fit the data, fit the data but it's a useful heuristic model. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We'll have a discussion about that another day. Uh, clarity. It should be easy to understand and apply. Models that I build and theories that I build, I think are perfectly easy to understand. I understand them perfectly well, but not everyone agrees with me. And I have been accused of perhaps being overcomplicated. Um, and they must be valuable. They must, uh, the propositions within the theory must be able to be assessed for accuracy. So those are, those are um, my take on those things. So let's look at some of the models of behaviour change. And I take two really simple models, and, I, and I, I do think they're models, and the reason I think they're models is because everyone who uses them calls them models, and they fit the definition that I just described. But I also very much concede that within a, 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 a definition of model in which you're looking at um, transitions and temporal dynamics uh, around uh, systems, then these are not necessarily models. But here's one that actually is, in, is probably the single most important model in public health, which is consumption, this is for cigarette price elasticity in societies like ours, changing consumption uh, has a price elasticity of around 40% or 0.4, right? What that means is you put the price of a packet of cigarettes up in real terms for a smoker and the consumption will go down by about 0.4 of what the price that you put up. This is hugely important, I think, you know, however simple this model might be, it's actually incredibly important uh, in terms of public health. If the figure was 0.05, then it would have different implications. And in different societies and different cultures at different times, that figure does change. But 0.4 is something is where it is at the moment. Uh, and then you've got another model, which is a truism model, uh, I would call it. It's one that I developed in order to explain to some of my somewhat more um, ignorant colleagues that you need to do more than just persuade people to try to stop. You also uh, can, you can use, uh, get some benefit from helping them to succeed. Uh, it's a very simple truistic model. The cessation rate of, in a population at a given time is equal to the proportion trying to stop and the success rates over that period of time. So these are simple, silly, trivial models in one sense, but very powerful and potentially important in terms of behaviour change. So then we come finally to um, a more complicated model, uh, which is actually a theory as well as a model. Um, and the model has many different propositions with it, and it's one that I, I developed back in that 2006 and been working on ever since. And an important feature of any theory or model is that it, you must be willing to change it when it doesn't work. And so you collect data and then you change it. Um, anyway, the, the principle of a model is it, it was devised as a way of integrating very, very different models and theories of motivation into a single framework so that you could, in the same model, encapsulate ideas of choice behavior, reflective choice, as well as drive states, as well as habit formation, as well as self-control, and all these other things. <coughs> and you might think that that is a ridiculously um, ambitious thing to try to do, uh, but I think that's succeeded. Uh, but at the, at the cost of some clarity, possibly. Um, so, and, and the basic 
one of the basic premises of the model is for a given level of opportunity and capability, which are potentially measurable characteristics of a situation, changing responses uh, requires changing the balance between competing momentary impulses and inhibitions. Now, I don't think that's a controversial statement. Um, all it's doing is it's, it's formulating, and using particular words, something that uh, most psychologists would consider to be uh, almost a truism. But then it gets more interesting because what determines what the balance is between those impulses and, and the inhibitions? And then it goes on to say that at the lowest level in the brain, uh, through our uh, evolutionary history, we've developed a system whereby through operant conditioning, through um, evolution, we have um, direct associations formed between stimuli and impulses and inhibitions. But then we've evolved another level of uh, capability, which is goal-directed behavior. So indirectly, these things are affected by wants and needs or motives. And I won't go through the details there, but what it basically does, if you put it into simple graphical terms, is, is it's an extension of the dual processing model that, that Kate referred to, but with a difference. Because what this model postulates is that these two processes in motivational system do not occur in parallel, they actually occur in series. What that means is that in order for you to um, get someone to do something, it's not enough for them to think it's a good idea. That has got to translate into a desire to do it, which is measurable, which then has to translate into the impulse or inhibition relevant to that. And at all times, that is competing with all the other direct and indirect influences operating at the time. So, uh, and we've done some various tests of this, and a very simple, naive test, talking about how theory can generate observations, is we all say in the smoking field, smoking, 70% of smokers want to stop smoking, right? We know this to be true. Uh, however, when you compartmentalize this, when you unpack it, and you, you ask smokers to say, do you think you should stop smoking? Do you want to stop smoking, both or neither of these? What you find is that about 30% of smokers will say they want to stop smoking, about 40% say they should, and lo and behold, when you follow people up, you find it is only those who say they want to stop smoking that actually have a higher probability of quitting. So these are simple models, simple statistical models of what's going on, driven by an underlying uh, uh, broad conceptualization of the process. So, and there are a number of hypotheses that arise out of this, all of which are potentially testable, even though they're not part of a dynamic systems model. But you can also turn this theory into a dynamic systems model, and, and I've been working with Daniel Rivera, who's a chemical engineer, and his colleagues to do that, um, predicting relapse following a quit attempt. And if you take two key parameters from the model, which is urges, which are, which are a mental representation of uh, impulses, and resolve, which is a mental representation of inhibition and the sources that uh, drive it. Um, we, can, we, can, we, we know from a lot of research that we've done from pharmacological studies and behavioral studies that there are a number of factors that go into that. And that can then be turned into a dynamic systems model, which is more of the kind that Anthony would be, uh, you know, would, would consider uh, appropriate. Although, having, you know, one has to bear in mind this is not a, this is a stochastic model, and it only works if you introduce jitter into it, because uh, that is effectively the way the brain works. But also, um, it, 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 you have to have jitter in order to create the stochastic nature of the relationships between the variables. So key messages, um, I think, are that models and theories can be useful at any level of specificity, however simple, even truistic sometimes, um, that having said that, um, we want to try to search for precision and for uh, uh, you know, an appropriate level of representation relevant to the problem that you have in hand. Um, and even if your models are imprecise, if they're not invaluable, they are not worth a bit.